अनिर्वेण्णस्थ विष्ठो भूर्धर्मयूपो महामक नक्षत्र नेमिर्नक्षत्री क्षमह क्षाम समीहन अनिर्वीण this uh, nama of the lord the first one and the last one samiha samihanaha i am clubbing them both together because the meaning is a little similar so anirvinnaha and samihanaha mihanaha <coughs> nirvinnaha means one who is not interested very often our work becomes very boring monotonous routine so sometimes we feel we don't feel interested there is no motivation there there is no inspiration there we have to do the same boring thing again and again and again and again so very often our uh, you know the uh, we we feel totally lost in our uh, when it comes to our energy why same thing i have to do everything it becomes very casual we take it for granted sometimes we don't even want to do it why every time i've been doing the same thing so there is nothing that gives us a, a push a motivation to uh, keep it going on anirvinnaha means the opposite of that bhagavan has never ever has a sense of disinterest interestedness he is always interested in doing whatever he is doing means that is why the word nava is used for him nava nava means new 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 means what everything looks fresh and new as though it was never ever done before so when something comes to us and when we are very inspired and motivated some new uh, piece of job or a, a piece of work in front of us which we had never done earlier we feel very inspired we feel very motivated and we put in all our effort over there complete focusing concentration a lot of energy we put in our enthusiasm will be there but slowly slowly as it goes on our enthusiasm enthusiasm slowly reduces in the case of bhagavan it never ever uh, decreases he is all neither it increases nor it decreases he is always there 100% enthusiastic in whatever he is doing and what is he doing he is doing that which he was doing right in the beginning of creation so from then onwards whatever the lord is doing does he never get tired fatigued exhausted and does he never ever get despondent you know that you know, depression like i have been doing so many things i have been trying to tell people uh, uh, educate them put them on the right path but still guide them on the right path but still they go off track how many times he tries to put us on the right track and again we go deviate so some sort of a disinterestedness doesn't come does it not come to him it never comes to him that's the meaning of anirvinna never bore he is never bored of doing anything it's a a state of positiveness a positive positiveness which has got no opposite normally when we say positive negative also will be there so sometimes he is in a positive mood and sometimes does he get into a negative mood no he never get because for him these two opposites don't exist for him but to make us understand the teachers use the word positive so a positive where it doesn't have an opposite called negative that's the meaning of anirvinna so absolutely no negative at all when we say i don't want to do this i'm feeling very low it's a state of negativity in us so therefore that is not there in him at all he is always ever there ready to do whatever he he wants to do so the whole of creation whenever it started from then onwards how many thousands and thousands and thousands of years have already passed how many yugas are over but still he is doing whatever he is doing never he gets tired bored fatigued exhausted a little bit of not interest in that to you know to be a little indifferent towards it no that's what it means over here so anirvinna similarly the uh, nama samihanaha also means the same he is always inspired he is always motivated he is very passionate about doing whatever he is doing as though he is doing it the very first time whenever we do anything the first time we are very very passionate of, ab- about it because we are doing something which somebody inspired us to do or motivated us to do so he is always in that passionate mode 
that is why we always say never never he loves to do whatever he is doing just to make it very simple and easy for us to understand and also it means over here so what is he doing everything all activities that the lord is doing whether it is creation or whether it, it is looking after maintaining nurturing nourishing or whether it is dissolution destruction constructive destruction that he is doing in every one of them all of them are nothing but a yagna for him when we say yagna yes we have to convert all our activities and karma into a worship for us there is an effort over there in his case he is doing everything like a, a worship not that he is worshiping somebody else he is doing it with that yagna bhava so when he is doing it in yagna bhava who is the yajman over there who is the doer over there he himself is the doer over there he himself is a doer over that so therefore uh, uh, that's uh, it's a very beautiful nama over there which is indicating to us how always we must be in an inspired mode only then whatever we are doing will come out the best this is very beautifully indicated in the uh, ramayana in one incident in the uh, uh, ramayana um the war is going on between uh, rama lakshmana and the vanaras on one side and ravana and his rakshasa army on the other side indrajit ravana san releases one deadly weapon and lakshmana has become unconscious we know that incident which comes in the ramayana so when lakshmana is over there unconscious rama thinks he is everybody thinks he is dead but he is not dead he is just unconscious over there and he is lying down he is not able to do anything he is not able to get up then rama is over there worried and he is also sitting over there and saying without lakshmana i don't anything i don't want anything i don't even want to fight the war he says so he is also sitting over there seemingly desperate because lakshmana is lying down over there then we are told the vaidya from uh, lanka comes anuman ji brings him and then he says no 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 he is not dead he is just unconscious he can be revived back we can get him back to life but we need a medicinal herb from where should it be procured it has to come from the north from the himalayas so who will go and get it from there lanka is down south the himalayas are far north and he, uh, the the doctor also says vaidya says the medicine the herb the magical herb must come before the sun rises otherwise we can't do anything about it so who will go at night and immediately bring it and then it should be administered to lakshmana before the sun rises so hanuman ji says i will go and get it so we know how hanuman ji goes he leaps into the uh, sky and then he goes up he travels all the way from south to north he lands in the himalayan region he is unable to identify what exactly the vaidya wanted so what does he do he picks up the entire mountain we are told sanjeevani parvata up he approaches it and then brings it from the north to the south and then afterwards we know that the uh, appropriate uh, herb medicinal herb is administered to lakshmana and he gets he is revived and then hanuman ji goes and places back the sanjeevani mountain uh, parvata from wherever he brought it this whole incident over there is has got a very beautiful message for us rama represents the intellect lakshmana represents the mind for us and this battle between the good which is represented by rama and his vanara army he is fighting with the bad with the negative with the evil represented by ravana and his party it's going on for us every day in the outer world it is going on inside our inner world also it's going on that conflict will always be there between the good and the bad what should i do what should i not do should i do this it is is it okay is it right on my part to do it is it dharma or is it adharma so this is constantly going on in us so sometimes when the enemy is very very strong powerful we can get exhausted when the bad in us when the evil in us when the temptations in us are very very powerful 
then sometimes we get very very fatigued exhausted because the it it looks like the good can't overpower the uh, bad which is all there inside us it happens sometimes so therefore we find rama and lakshmana very very exhausted over there and we have seen lakshmana also becomes unconscious over there unconscious mean the mind is not available for us we can apply it to all our daily routine also boring 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 monotonous routine work so sometimes we don't get inspired to get up and do it but something very new immediately we get up and try to do from where did you get the energy just a few minutes back you said i cannot do it i'm totally exhausted i don't want to do it but that was routine work now this is something very very interesting and you know we are passionate about it it's something new never ever tried therefore suddenly we find all the energy getting into us so my lakshmana lying down over there represents our own mind not cooperating with us it's become tired it's become fatigued for whatever reasons innumerable infinite reasons are there in us when the mind doesn't get up what will the poor intellect do it's got all the knowledge it's got all the information everything is there it wants to help and work itself out through the mind and then through the body but it the mind is not available therefore rama also seemingly sits down over there because he needs lakshmana the intellect in us needs our mind it has to function through our mind only at that point of time what are we to, sometimes we say helpless we are in a negative mood we are in the low my mind is not cooperating with me i am feeling very down depressed we say i am feeling very low it can be a- anything at that point of time our mind is like lakshmana lying down over there and no the buddhi cannot do anything in fact anybody around us and about us try to tell us something we will not get up and again enter into the field of activity at all at that point of time somebody must come who comes hanuman ji comes who is hanuman ji hanuman ji represents the guru for us or hanuman ji represents it can he can represent a, an object for us he can represent a person for us he can represent a situation for us which will completely take us out of our depression take us out of our despondency take us out, if we have to be recharged charged back charges all come become totally low in us so somebody has to charge us somebody has to act like a catalyst and make us get up and get into the field of activity and perform how should we perform we should perform very well otherwise success will not come whether it is in the materialistic field or whether it is in the spiritual field both fields we have been doing japa been doing meditation in uh, puja we are doing let's say vishnu sahasrama since years we have been doing it we have been chanting every saturday saturday and we become very very cool casual monotonous boring it has become every day it's become an everyday affair for us so there's no energy over there we don't do things how we are supposed to do it when that happens we will never get the palas also so therefore hanuman ji represents for us a guru spirituality he represents a guru materialistic our samsar somebody for us will come in our lives who will say get up why are you sitting down like this what happened to you we need somebody to boost us up otherwise we will be grounded over there uh, lakshmana is grounded he has become unconscious so the intellect rama also cannot do anything he seems to be helpless over there at that point of time hanuman ji enters so it can be our guru spiritual guru it can be anybody who will come and then literally give us a shake and tell us get up no no i can't get up i don't think i can do it i don't have the energy to do it i don't want to do it somebody has to really give us a proper shake and then you know put us back on our two feet and stand over there behind us or along with us and make us do whatever we are doing get us out of that negativity the state of negativity into which we have fallen into get us out of that depression that we have fallen into get us out of that you know that feeling of oh i am not at all interested in doing anything we have to get out of that that is what is represented by the sanjeevani being brought by hanuman ji 
it's very very symbolic over there what does sanjeevani represent jiva means life all of us have life if somebody says can you describe your life we can't describe our life all that can we can all that we can uh, describe to somebody is our life's experiences jeevana we can uh, uh, you know uh, share with somebody talk about it but jiva we can't jiva is the life in us which gives us the forward thrust to enter into different different fields of endeavor and then engage ourselves in the in the activity for whatever we want in our lives so jiva is there jivana means life's experiences how and also how we express ourselves in the field outside or within ourselves also because there is an external world and an internal world over there. and for all that yes life jiva is needed but this jivana in us has somehow become low negativity it has entered for whatever reasons then therefore jiva jivana samjivana our jivana has become monotonous boring routine i don't want to do it full of inner negativity that jivana must get charged some means completely totally we have to be put back on to our two feet so sanjivana there represents a, a motivation or an inspiration it can be one word it can be a one one look from somebody or it can be a solid shake you know somebody shaking us literally physically to make us you know come back to our senses and get up and do whatever we are supposed to do a, a, a booster dose a catalyst again like i said in the materialistic field and in the spiritual even in the spiritual field religious field many things become routine for us we need somebody a guru to enter into our lives and say no this is not routine this is not boring you must be passionate about passionate about doing everything that you are everything should look like first time i am doing it first time i am doing it then only that pa that passionate mood in us can get sustained otherwise it will get depleted and de decrease so that is Sanjeev that is what sanjeevani represents for all of us so that is why many of us we have seen hanuman ji over there carrying the sanjeevani in one hand that mountain and in the other hand one gada in his hand and that little doll like thing we hang it near the threshold near the main door in the car why constantly we want to be reminded about this positiveness hanuman ji bringing the sanjeevani into the life of rama and lakshmana in that situation the moment he brings sanjeevani lakshmana gets revived and then we know what happens he is immediately able to kill indrajit indrajit is extremely powerful he is the counter for lakshmana lakshmana and indrajit represents the same mind in us the good part of our mind is lakshmana and the bad part of our mind is indrajit both of them are face to face with each other lakshmana is therefore over is able to overpower indrajit and kill him and destroy him only when sanjeevani the medicine called sanjeevani has been um, becomes effective in him so therefore all of us need a little dose of sanjeevani in our life now and then now and then we need it sometimes we say now and then now and then will you please call me up and tell me inspire me and keep me always in that inspired mood otherwise i become very low i don't feel like doing anything therefore you please now and then remind me send me a message or call me up what is it that we are asking in our lives we are asking for sanjeevani in our lives which is most essential for all of us some of these pictures you know we can we know we we have all seen the picture of hanuman ji carrying the sanjeevani that picture itself should remind us so some of the pictures in each picture in in the ramayana every uh, instance is like a slide in front of us so hanuman ji bringing the sanjeevani hanuman ji uh, burning up lanka he sets lanka into flame each one of them represents something very very significant and suggestive to all of us it's not just a story over there at 
So does Bhagavan also need a Sanjeevani in his life? No, he doesn't need Sanjeevani. He is Sanjeevani himself. He is the one who will keep us going on. He says this, I, to keep me going on, I need her constantly to tell me something. Or I need constantly to connect with my Guru. Every time a message from, comes from the Guru, or he writes, whatever it is, I feel charged up. I feel boosted up. I become immediately inspired and motivated to do whatever I am doing. That is the meaning. So, Bhagavan needs it. He doesn't need any of these things at all. So, Anirvinnaha and Samihanaha. Both of them, this almost the same meaning over there. That is what he is. Always in, 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 in an inspired mode. That is why we use the word Nava for him. New, Nava means, Nava means nine, Nava also means new. There is always a newness, there is always a freshness over there. In our case, newness is not there, freshness is also not there. Therefore, we feel depleted of all our energy. Bhagavan is not like, if we read the Ramayana, if we read Bhagavat especially, Krishna's story, because Krishna is Purna Avatara. How he is right from the beginning, the moment he was born, up to the, the whole story. Every moment we find him so inspired, so passionate about whatever he is doing. Does Krishna ever get tired? Now and then, now and then, does he take a break and say, I am not interested in doing this? Never ever is there is that there in his life. When we read the stories and the glories of Krishna, that is why Hari Ananta, Hari Kata Ananta, that is the meaning of this. Ananta means infinite. He is infinite. His glories are infinite. Why? Because he is like this. He is Anirvindaha and he is Samihanaha. Always. Every day, every moment is fresh for Krishna. Every day he goes and steals butter. And every day he goes to so many houses and steals. But every moment there is a freshness. That is why the gopis wanted him to come again and again and again. They never got bored. Why? Because Krishna association reflected glory. He never got bored, therefore they also never got bored and therefore every day they, uh, they, you know, they churned butter, they kept it for him, they waited for him to come and take it away and so that they can go again back and complain to uh, Yashoda also. Every day this is happening. See, every day is a newness and a newness and a freshness for them. Never is it old. That's the meaning of Anirvindaha and Samihanaha. Stavishtaha, it came in the sixth uh, verse already, the same word. It means that which is supremely dense, supremely gross, very, very, very heavy. Why is Bhagavan called as very heavy? Over here, heavy doesn't mean kg wise. Very heavy means it, he must be occupying lot of space, gross it is, not subtle we are talking. And, and so beautifully over here, he supremely grow, the, the reality, the ultimate reality called Brahman, called Paramatma or, or called Parabrahma is the subtlest reality. Because that reality that is there in all of us, Paramatma, we can't see. We can't see him, we can't talk to him, we can't connect with him, with our sense organs. Which means he is not gross, he is subtle. How subtly is, is he? He is subtler than the subtlest. Because space that we are aware of is very subtle. But Bhagavan is the one who even created space. Therefore, he must be subtler than the subtlest. Sukshma, Sukshmataram. But the subtlest of subtlest realities is supremely gross. The contradiction over there. Only for Bhagavan, opposite qualities align themselves. For us, it doesn't align at all. Either we are fat or we are thin, either we are tall or we are short. Either we are educated or we are not educated, we can't be both at one and the same time. But for Bhagavan, Tadviruddha Lakshanas very beautifully complement each other. And they align so beautifully. When sometimes things we try to align them forcefully, there will be distortion, ugliness will come in, symmetry will go away. But in his case, it never happens. So therefore, Stavishtaha means one who is very, very gross. Why? All of the 14 worlds are in him. Krishna Tulabar. Satyabhama could not weigh him with all her wealth. She looked at Krishna. He is not fat. 
how is it that all the wealth that i have got is not able to balance the pan on which he is sitting is he so heavy she looked at him he smiled i told you he said i warned you narada also warned you but you did not listen so the 14 words are there in the mean how expansive he must be how broad he must be in quotes with there all more of a suggestion than literal meaning over there because something very 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 dense and very gross it should be be huge it should spread out everywhere how much has he spread out he has spread out everywhere where we can't even comprehend all our known areas of knowledge all our unknown areas of knowledge everything he is is there in him how broad he must be how vast he must be how all pervading he must be therefore he must be gross but at one and the same time he is subtle also because even in the god particle he is there tiniest of tiny particles is there so he is smaller than the smallest and larger than the largest he is lighter than the lightest and heavier than the heaviest he is nearer than the nearest and farther than the farthest that is indicated in this word stavishta and also when we say very very heavy and gross and uh, you know dense it brings in stability when we want something to be stable and not fly away what do we do we anchor it over there we put something very heavy on it so that in the passing breeze it won't fly away so if he is so gross and if he is so dense it means he brings stability everywhere stability in the outer world and stability in our inner world also who is it who brings stability for all of us that balance that we need in all our at all levels of our equipment not only our mind should be stable stability over there intellectual stability must be there physical stability also should be there not just standing on two feet and not toppling off everything inside us the water content stability the heat content stability neither it should be more nor it should be less so all no excesses anywhere at all so that's beaut it's a very beautiful concept we have to keep thinking about it that stability at universal level and individual level micro level macro level gross level subtle level all of it he only achieves he only brings about to so, stavishtah abhuhu bhu means to become to come into existence bhava means to become so we become something that is why we say bhava sagara bhava sagara mean samsa ocean of samsara bhava means to become constantly we are becoming something becoming something becoming something till 4 o'clock we were we had not become a satsangi so suddenly at 4 there was a birth what was the new birth for all of us we became a satsangi for this satsang so we will maintain it for one hour then after that what will happen it will change so the satsangi dies and somebody else will be born if we go to the kitchen to make ourselves whatever we want we become a cook the role changes over there that person is born functional name that person is born and this person has died satsangi has as as been now born for us whatever we were earlier now supposing after the satsang we choose to go out and drive our own vehicle we become a driver so the birth of the driver and the death of a satsangi so every moment bha bhu bhava so bhava means constantly changing but death birth death birth death goes on in us not we are not talking about our birthday that was is there for all of us long long ago when we were born and just one death day for us every moment in our lives birthdays are there and death days are there in the same functionally one aspect of my personality dies another pers- aspect of my personality is born that after some time dies and again something is born so that is the meaning of bhava bhu means to become to come into existence it means birth over there abhu ho means one who never has any birth at all ajaha ja means to be born bhagavan is ajaha 
we are all born in space and time so there was a change till then we were not a member of our family till we were born maybe there were five people now we have six person entered so changes happen then every moment changes happening to us within us as we grow up and then we get information knowledge and then our life every moment is different for us means we are completely in a realm of change one moment is born for us and then next again when the next moment uh, second comes this dies away and in that one second or in that one minute we are played out whatever role we were supposed to play so birth death birth death is always there in space and time for us cause effect relationship is always there for us in space and time bhagavan is beyond space and time he is beyond this cause effect relationship it can't touch him at all so how will he be described abhu there is no birth at all for him birth is in time birth is in space we were all born in a particular city in a particular area at particular time particular day year month etc so bhagavan has got nothing at all he is never ever born so when there is no birth for him there is no question of growth for him when there is no growth for him there is no variation modification for him then there is no disease for him disease mean something going and coming it doesn't mean only physical diseases there is no decay for him for us there is decay and finally there is no death for him also so all of them are indicated in this one word abhuhu so absolutely nothing for him and yet he exists for us existence means birth date must have been there and at the death date we cease to exist we as a person nama roopa guna guna kriya vyakti personality ceases to exist if he has no birth then does he exist he is the very existence which is allowing all existence to exist on it the whole realm of change outer were 14 worlds gross worlds subtle worlds everything needs a, a, a foundation or a platform on which it can exist and play about the whole drama of our lives all our lives put together all 14 worlds put together where is it being played out it has to be played out on some platform so what is that platform on which the entire drama of life is going on from in all the 14 world bhagavan is the solid platform they call it a substratum adhisthana the absolute existence which lends existence to everything else he lends he lends existence first of all for things to exist for beings to exist and afterwards whatever drama we are playing out in our lives our tragedies our comedies whatever it is all of that exists only because he exists in him everything is being played out therefore that's what is indicated by abhuhu dharma yupa dharma yes dharma yupa yupa means post anything something has to be tied out po- a, a post whenever a shamiana is erected a tent is erected first they will put the posts over there poles will be there the poles are all po- fixed up first and then only the shamiana is put whether it is the side shamiana covering on the side or whatever is there on top all of them with the help of ropes they are all tied to these poles so bhagavan over here he uh, the teacher says or the vishnu sahasranam says is a upaha he is a post is he a post what is tied on to him dharma upaha dharma is tied on to him and is permanently fixed 22 sorry 24 into 7 365 days starting from the day of creation up to dissolution constantly dharma is tied to him there is never ever, ever an escape at all for him what does that mean he is dharma itself he is an embodiment of perso- personification of dharma he is dharma and the post also is he dharma upa i mean i am the dharma post he said so everything everything is he so dharma upa i mean i am the post to which dharma is tied it's a way of saying mean i am the i am the solid fixed the pole is always fixed solid in the ground 
so that the other ropes can be tied to it. That pole should not change, should not oscillate. Then the whole shamiana, the tent will start oscillating and it can come down also. So for everything to remain where it is, we need a solid pole over there onto which everything can be tied. Even an animal, the bullocks, the cows, they tie them up to a post. A little bit of freedom is given for them to move around, but they should not stray away. They all have to be over here in this particular area. Therefore, the animal is tied to a post. So the, po uh, the pole makes sure that it doesn't stray away and move away from it. So for all of us, there is a fixed pole in all of us. And what is it? Dharma Yupaha. Bhagavan is the uh, Dharma post, uh, Dharma pole we can say, in each and every one of us. And he therefore helps us to align ourselves with him. Whole of nature aligns themselves to him. Mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, animal kingdom, they all are aligned to him. All of them are very strictly following whatever they are supposed to follow. They follow dharma. Mother nature included over there. So if, uh, if uh, winter has to go and spring has to come, spring has to come. It can't say, no, I will not come now, I will come after two months. And when spring comes, all the trees which had, you know, shed all their dry leaves, green it has to become. The tree can't say, I won't generate any uh, leaves now, green, green leaves, fresh new leaves. I let, let me take a break and come back after two months. It can't. All of them beautifully align themselves to them. It's always like they have surrendered. Surrender is not a word which people, oh, uh, we, it is slavish mentality. It's not a slavish mentality at all. It's a very, very positive state. So everything in nature has surrendered so beautifully, completely and totally to the Lord. And therefore, everything is going on very, very smoothly. Our solar system, whatever is going around, our earth, it not only rotates about its axis, but it moves around also. It's doing its dharma. Why? Dharma post is there. Bhagavan is there in the form of dharma, making sure that it is doing whatever it has to do. So, so all of them follow their dharma. Diamond, diamond is carbon. Carbon also is carbon. You know, the, the lead over there. But is the suit over there. But diamond has to um, uh, express its dharma and suit has to express its dharma. Both are carbon. So suit will be like this and diamond will be like this. Both of them are carbon. Suit suddenly can't say, after all I am carbon, why can't I also glitter like a diamond? Or diamond cannot say, every moment I have been only shining and shining and shining and illumining things. Let me also take a break. Can't do it. So all of them are very beautifully following Dharma. Why? Dharma post is there. The pole called Dharma is there. In, an, uh, in each and everything, and in every being, small or big, in the God particle, Dharma Yupaha is there, Bhagavan is there. And making that God particle do its Dharma. The electron, the neutron, the proton, the atom, the molecule, in each and everything, dharma is there embedded in it. Dharma is an integral part of it and makes it do whatever it is supposed to do. Only we human beings you know, deviate from it. Is it there in us? Of course, Bhagavan is there in us also. So, Bhagavan is there in the form of dharma in us also. But what do we do? We have been given a choice. Since we have been given a choice, we choose to do what is not dharma. It's all up to us. We can align ourselves to dharma and make our lives. We can align ourselves to adharma and break our lives. Choice has been given to us. But it doesn't mean that dharma is not there in us. Bhagavan is called as dharma also. And he says post. Post is just to tell us he is well established in us. He is well rooted in us. He is solid in us. We can never ever say he is not there and therefore I did this wrong thing. We are never God forsaken people. Never. 
we can become man forsaken people people can leave us and go away but bhagavan can never leave us and go he as the dharma in us can never leave us and go away if he goes we collapse so in that sense dharma you is like a solid pillar in us all that we need to do is lean on to him not even a pole he is a solid pillar in us who dharma all that we have to do is just lean on to him but we he should tie us up to him he is tied us up also but we choose to go away what to do we choose to go away from him we choose to divert the very beautiful uh, verses there in mukundamala written by kulashekar alwar he says today oh lord right now not even today right now this very second he says please take this swan of my mind he addresses his own mind as a swan because now his mind is listening to him so hamsa pakshi so the mind the swan called my mind is right now okay aligned to spirituality he tells the lord can you please take this mind the swan of my mind and lock it up in the cage of your feet so he likens bhagavan's feet to a cage and he says please take this swan because it can fly away it can move away so this mind we know how our mind is manava nilli suvudu balu katina dasaru writes gita also arjuna says chanchalam hi mana krishna very difficult can we contain a storm no we can't contain a storm like that it is this mind also very difficult to contain it so therefore kulashekar alwar says in one of the verses of mukundamala that's one beautiful stotra he has written in sanskrit describing the glories of krishna it's very beautiful mukundamala so he says take this swan of my mind and put it into your cage into the cage called your feet put it in there and lock it up because then if it is open it will come out why he says now right now because at the end when i am exiting my physical body he says when i am exiting my physical body when there is so much of pain physical death they say is accompanied by lot of pain so in that fear will be there sorrow will be there grief will be there pain will be there when we are exiting our physical body at that point of time and everything will be choked inside breathing itself is difficult choking will be there at that point of time in such a condition i don't think i'll be able to remember you lord i may not be able to remember you therefore today right now catch this swan of my mind and put it into the cage of your feet and you lock it up it doesn't say you lock it up but then put it over there then it's a lord's um you know responsibility to make sure that the mind doesn't come away at all dharma yupa it's a very beautiful uh, nama of the lord so he is dharma if he is dharma does he practice dharma whatever he does is only aligned to dharma nothing the lord does which is not aligned to dharma all his activities in fact when dharma declines that's what he has told us in the gita when dharma declines and adharma is on the rise i will come back he says and make sure adharma it becomes extinct dharma is again brought back to glory and for that i again and again come i again i again and again come he said so dharma yupaha maha makaha makaha means yajna we already now know that yajna doesn't mean only a homa all our in the gita bhagavad gita bhagavan has told us every karma we can convert it into a yajna every piece of job work we can convert it into a worship work should become worship actions must become worship karma must become a karma yoga karma must become a yajna so we the, the gita elaborates on that chapter 3 chapter a, a little bit of chapter 2 then 3 4 and 5 all are on karma so therefore when maka means yajna over here what yajna is the lord talking about every activity so maha maha means great maka means yajna one who is conducting yajna 
So he is the one who is conducting the greatest of yajnas. That is why we say Vishnu is yajna and yajna is Vishnu. What yajna is doing? Everything that he is doing is a yajna only. His creation is a yajna, maha yajna. Not an ordinary thing. He didn't create only small, small little things and a few little quantum. Infinite is the extent of his creation. So the volume, if we take into consideration the largeness and the volume of it also, he is not a person who is doing an ordinary yajna. It's a maha yajna that the Lord is doing over here. So his creation is a maha yajna. He is maintaining and looking after is another maha yajna. How many things he has to look after? We can't look after four people, five people at home. We can't simultaneously cook four things on the, on the stove, though there are four burners over there. We get confused. How he is so beautifully managing everything. It's a maha yajna that he is doing. And of course, the constructive destruction that he is doing also is a great yajna. So, yajna and also we have seen advaita, one without a second. Yajna is... Who is the yajman over there who is performing the yajna? That also he is. What is he doing? That also he is. And the outcome of that also he is. He is everything. Everything is he only. From our standpoint, we see different, 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 different. Um, fourth chapter, Bhagavad Gita, Brahmaarpanam, Brahma Havihir, that shloka, which we normally say, it's, it's a prayer that we normally say just before eating our food. So it says over there, everything is Brahman. Everything is Brahman. So the, the Homakund, if we can consider it as a Homa, the Homakund is Bhagavan. Then whatever we put into the Homakund, the, the logs of wood, the small twigs, everything is Bhagavan. Then what about the fire which, which we light up over there to conduct the Homa? The fire also is Bhagavan. Who is the one who is conducting? There must be a person who is conducting the Homa, Yajaman and his wife. Both are Bhagavan. The Pandit is there who is chanting. The, uh, the Pandit is there. He is also Bhagavan. He has to chant the appropriate chants. Depending on what Yajna we are doing. All the chants that he is chanting are all nothing but Bhagavan only. What are the ingredients that we are putting into the Homa Kund? The Dravya? It depends on what uh, Yajna we are doing, what Homa we are doing. All the Dravyas are nothing but Bhagavan himself. And finally at the end, when the Karma Pala comes to us, the Purnavati also is Bhagavan. And when the Pala comes to us, the result of that Homa, who partakes of it, whoever performed it. If he is the Karta, Bhagavan is the Karta, he becomes the Bhokta also. Therefore, where is you, is what the Lord is asking us over there. Where is you mean, where is the ego? Ego has no place anywhere at all. So in that sense, so, so from individual to, so whether we are performing small, small little activities in the kitchen, in our office, whatever we are doing, we are in the market buying something, Everything can be converted into a yajna. And who is doing the yajna? He says, I alone. I alone am you, he says. I alone am you. You the customer. I am the salesman also. The shop is me. Whatever is there, is there in the shop also is me only. We have gone to do a yajna of, of buying things. Everything over there. What about all the people there? That also is me only. The owner also is me. The cashier also is me. And the transaction that you do, you buy and you pay, that also is me. And when you feel very happy that you got whatever you wanted, that happiness also I only enjoy. So where is I coming in between over there? So if this attitude comes to us, we are, we are, we have performed a maha yagni. So each one of us, so every incident, every event in our every activity can become a yagni. All of us put together. Lord says, I am not only you and I am not only she and I am not only he. I am all. Mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, animal kingdom, human kingdom, rakshasas, gods, semi uh, divine being, all he is. All of them doing all their yajnas, I only am doing, he says. Therefore, he must become the greatest yajna 
performer and also he must become the greatest yajna also therefore maha makaha nakshatra nemihi nakshatras means stars we are told there are 27 stars starting from ashwini nakshatra to revati nakshatra 27 stars are there all of us are born under one star and every star has got four padas four aspects four parts let us say so each one of us are born under one 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 nakshatra over there bhagavan says i am the one around which all dharma yupa all the nakshatras must be there somebody must be holding them all together keeping them all in their place and making them do whatever they are supposed to be doing they say you are born under this nakshatra then these are your characteristics if you are born under this nakshatra then these are your characteristics which means star to star nakshatra to nakshatra there is difference so who makes all these nakshatras stay wherever they are who gives to them their characteristics and who makes sure that their characteristics are all implemented so when we are born under that the, under the influence of an that nakshatra these these characteristics will be there nothing should go awry everything has to be very beautifully synchronized over there harmony should be there who is the one bhagavan is in the center over there and make each star do its dharma every day is attributed to one star they can't jump the line uh, revati nakshatra cannot say i am the last one next month i am going to come second or third i am going to jump the line they can't they have to come in that sequence only and when they are there they influence the day also they influence that aspect of the day in the, in, a, in a particular city differences will be there how many things are there so complex and complicated but everything is being managed so beautifully who is the one behind it bhagavan is the one behind it all so naksha and also nakshatras have got their own light who is the one who gives light to all these stars we, we are told the sun is the biggest star moon doesn't have its own light but stars have who gives to them the light to shine the lord is there illumining them and therefore they are bright and they in turn illumine or they shine over there what makes them shine it's because he is there just behind lending his effulgence and brilliance to them so that in turn they can shine so he is there at the center of all of them the stars making them do and not only stars we can put in the planets also over there nakshatra graha nakshatras who is the one who is there at the center of the entire planetary system entire nakshatra system star system the entire solar system and making everything do whatever they are supposed to do they never ever deviate even a little even a little who is there dharma yopaha he is there solid as a pillar or the center we can say the actionless center around which all activities are going on dasaru has written a very beautiful uh, uh, shloka sorry uh, devarnam sakala graha balanine sarasi jaksha sakala graha all the strength and the might and the power of every planet which is making which is influencing all of us in different different ways their permutations and combination you are the strength behind it all everything you are you are time you are the planets you are the stars you are the muhurta time intervals different different time intervals you are the you are the month you are the year comprising of 12 months you are every month comprising of 30 days you are the day comprising of 24 hours you are the fortnights pakshamas and in everything you are very it's a very very beautiful philosophical uh, uh, devarnama do we very be- it's it's a lovely devarnama to sing but then lot of philosophy is embedded over there in that one devarnama that purandar dasura has written sakala graha bala nine sarasi jaksha so therefore nakshatra nemi nakshatri you are the lord of the stars so he comes down to the stars only limited area so only 27 stars if we take who is the lord of all of them who maintains them looks after these 27 of them 27 people in the family somebody must be there to look after them 
who is look looking after them the moon looks after them moon is supposed to be the consort of the 27 stars he is married the 27 stars. when we say marriage we shouldn't think of it like our marriage associated with so the moon borrows its light from the sun and he in turn is the one who has his very strong influence on these stars and the moon in us represents our mind so over here when Bhagavan says nakshatri he means lord of the stars in the 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita Bhagavan says I am among the stars he says I am the moon nakshatranam aham shashihi amongst the stars I am the moon he said so all these are just to indicate to us that nothing exists but the Lord alone. So Nakshatri, I am the Lord of the stars, which means I am the moon. Kshamaha, Kshamaha means again over here, one who is very Kshamata, one who is very, very efficient. So passion should be there, uh, engaging must be there, uh, to engage with inspiration, motivation, everything must be there. Otherwise, we will never be efficient. Proficiency, of course, should be there. We should know what we are doing and then do properly. Bhagavan is the one who has got everything with him in infinite measure. So, Kshamaha therefore means he is supremely efficient in whatever he does. Whatever Bhagavan does, he is very very efficient. 100% more than 100%. Nothing ever ever goes in vain. Nothing ever, nothing ever gives a negative result to him. He is so efficient he is. He is so brilliant he is. And you know the art of doing everything also. That is one meaning. Another meaning of Kshama is extremely patient with all of us. Allows us, allows us, allows us, allows us, gives us a long rope. So therefore one who has got supreme patience with all of us is Bhagavan. Nobody else will be so patient with us. And also is supremely efficient in whatever he does. Not efficient, with skillful efficiency it is. Proficient, skillful efficiency. So, Kshamaha, Kshamaha, Kshamaha actually means, we use it for famine. Famine means what? Nothing is there. Nothing is there, means nothing is there. So, is nothing there? No. Kshama therefore means alone. Nothing is there. So, he is the alone, means there is nothing apart from him. He alone exists, is the meaning of Kshamaha. We are told in the in the Purana as it comes, when deluge Mahapralaya happens, who is there? Everything just collapses. Everything goes off into non-existence. What about Bhagavan? What about Brahman, Paramatma, Parabrahma, the nameless, the formless? He alone is. Alone is nothing else over there. In that sense. We should we shouldn't take it in the sense of Famine. Famine means nothing is there. That's what it means over there. So the implication, the, the suggestiveness and the significance over there. So Kshamaha means he alone is there. Nothing else exists. He alone is. Therefore they say our journey, spiritual journey towards him, he is alone. We are also alone. We can't group, go like a group, collective. All that is at our level. Bhajan, Satsang, all those things. But when we want to reach him, he is alone. So to, uh, to the alone, alone only must start the journey. All alone, we must walk the path. Alone, all alone to the alone. Alone, all alone to the alone. That other last alone is capital A. He alone is. Nothing else is there. Poor thing, we feel like saying, no, nothing is there. Is he happy? Of course he is happy. He is reveling and reveling and reveling within him, with himself. He doesn't need anybody else. He doesn't need anything else to uh, derive enjoyment from, to get happiness from. He alone is. Rama means that. Sarve Ramanti Iti Ramaha. One who is reveling and reveling and reveling and reveling in everything and in every being, individual and universal, is Rama. So, Kshamaha Samihanaha, we've already gone through. So the 47th verse is over, the 48th shloka verse, we will take it up in the next class.